Good morning, folks. It uh, truly is an honor to share a stage with a number of our nation's most dynamic uh, elected officials. Um, I want to do a few things uh, over the next 15 minutes or so, and then hopefully we can have a conversation. The first is to really um, pay back a little debt to San Antonio. Um, we have benefited just tremendously from Charlie Gonzalez, who uh, was a leader of a project that we are working on, on just the broad, you know, kind of big bones of how you make the democracy work. And as Henry uh, indicated, uh, we call Henry a bipartisan policy center recidivist, because every time he gets out of a project, somehow he winds up with us again. Um, but it has been, I think, a real honor and pleasure to be able to work uh, with two of the favorite sons of San Antonio. Um, what Henry didn't mention is, just to give you a little more of the flavor of our, our work, on immigration, he's sharing a leadership of this project with Condi Rice, Ed Rendell, and Haley Barber. And these are not centrists. And this says really something about the essence of the way we see the world, which is what I want to try to share with you uh, now. We are not the nonpartisan policy center, the postpartisan policy center, the transpartisan policy center, or the metapartisan policy center. Our view is that the way this country has worked for 230 years is the constructive collision between proud Democrats and proud Republicans. And so when we take on work, whether it's energy or tax or health care, our goal really is to find people who can capture 80% of the conversation. Um, and that really is, I think, what motivated me to want to try to write uh, this book, because there is a sense from so many of the people who are frustrated with Washington that the answer is that we should just get rid of politics. And of course, our view is exactly the opposite. Um, what we want to do is to create productive partisanship, which is the basic idea you know, that's made the country work. I mean, our founders were incredible idealists who created this crazy system, which doesn't work in any other country in the world, in which people who don't know each other, like each other, live near each other, look like each other, simply have to work together. And for you know, the last two centuries, it has been that diversity and the synthesis of those views that really has been the backbone of creating what we think is resilient and you know, good public policy. Now that all sounds very quaint. Um, I noticed after my name in your program, it was just blank. Um, I think the notion of there being a thing called the Bipartisan Policy Center is bewildering these days to many. Um, but this is not you know, a reflection on you know, the days of yore you know, back in the 1870s. I think most of you, certainly Henry and Charlie, remember the Clinton years not that long ago. Not exactly a kumbaya moment for American politics. Politics of personal destruction, Lewinsky scandal. I mean, Congress impeached the guy. And while they were impeaching President Clinton, they were passing legislation. The night that Clinton was impeached, he was on the phone with Speaker Gingrich talking about legislation. There was a different sense of connectivity that allowed this town to metabolize the kind of aggression and hostility that is essential in a democracy and still get some work done. Trent Lott uh, shared a story with me um, that he was you know, in bed 2, 3 a.m., and the phone rings. And I kind of picture him like pajamas with one of those, you know, kind of hats on. I don't know if that's, that's just my imagination. But, but it's, you know, we would take a call from the president. And, you know, his wife kind of hands him the phone and, you know, he uh, says, well, yeah, yes, Mr. President. And, you know, they talk for about six or seven minutes. And, yes, Mr. President, I'll just, you know, try to do that, Mr. President. And hangs up the phone and uh, Trent's wife says, what the heck was that about? To which he says, I don't really know. I think it might have had something to do with Latin America. Right? I mean, President Clinton was just working the phones. You know, he was just talking to people all, all the time. And it, there was a South American <clears throat> trade deal. And I asked the senator, so did you support the president? He's like, yeah, I think I, I probably did. You know, it was just that kind of um, connection. And so what we talk about writ large, and then I'll get to some of the more kind of concrete questions, is um, we're a divided and sorted and polarized country. We're not going to change that. So the question is, what can we do in that reality to still be competent. And the good news, I will tell you, is I think most of the efforts to address this, most of the reform efforts, um, are basically focused on the wrong things. They take us down these box canyons. So if you're frustrated that none of the reform is you know, taking us someplace, um, good news. Uh, it probably has no possibility of succeeding. We should change the agenda a little. And let me just give you what I call the unholy trinity. It's you know, money, media, and gerrymandering. And just for a moment, there's always been money in politics. 
you know, the fact that we know where it is now, much of it, is a good thing. Um, after uh, John Kennedy won the presidency, he read a telegram from his father saying, don't buy a single vote more than necessary. I'll be damned if I'm going to pay for a landslide. Right? I mean, obviously, some acknowledgment. But the bigger picture is not that money in politics is not important. It's incredibly important. And it's having a real effect on the system. But they call it the Supreme Court for a reason. And the Supreme Court has said in very clear language that money is a form of speech. And that is not going to change anytime soon. So no matter what you think, um, if, you know, go ahead and create your constitutional convention. You know, I I'm, I'm, might be alive when it's done. Um, this, you know, this is not a practical answer. The media, it's always been awful. Right? It's different now, but you know, the election of 1800 between John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, two of our great statesmen, the uh, newspaper supporting Jefferson called, um, said that Adams was of a horrible hermaphroditic nature who had neither the firmness of a man nor the sensibilities of a woman. Jefferson's paper responded, I'm sorry, Adams' paper responded essentially that if Jefferson was elected, murder, rape, robbery, and incest would be openly taught and practiced. <laughs> so, you know, the Rachel Maddow, kind of Sean Hannity, you put it in context, right? It's different. But we're not going to change it, right? All the people who lament the media are basically wasting their breath because the media is responding to essentially what we're asking for. And gerrymandering is a little more, you know, complex. It's definitely corrosive to the democracy to have you know, our elected officials picking their voters as opposed to our voters picking our elected officials. But it doesn't matter nearly as much as people think. Because again, we've done an organic gerrymander. We've basically sorted ourselves, which makes it almost impossible to draw competitive districts in most of the country. Um, a Stanford study after the 2010 census and kind of competitive redistricting concluded that maybe six seats had shifted. Um, and so again, it, it matters. I think it's a process issue that should be dealt with. We've made a number of recommendations in our uh, commission on political reform to try to create um, bipartisan redistricting commissions, uh, which is different from independent redistricting commissions. But my favorite poll ever um, came out after the 2008 election. Some of you may have heard it was called the Whole Foods Cracker Barrel Poll. And what this poll revealed is that 81% of the counties that voted for President Obama had a Whole Foods. 36% had a Cracker Barrel. Fast forward to the 2010 election, Republican um, sweep takeover of the House, 82% of the House members who shifted from Democrat to Republican lived in districts with Cracker Barrels, right? We have separated ourselves, and it's something that we just simply have to understand. So when talking about solutions, um, you know, I think of them as kind of coming in two camps. We have to address both nature and nurture, the nature of how we elect people, and then what happens to them when they get here to Washington. And so on election reform, there's a lot that can be done, particularly focused on primary elections, and it's all around deepening the voter pool. One out of five people who are registered to vote, vote in primary elections. And the majority of outcomes are decided in the primaries. And so you know, our commission made the bold recommendation to try to increase it over a decade from one in five to one in three. This is no Australian mandatory voting, but you know, if, if one out of three people could actually participate in the franchise, our sense is that would change the quality of the conversation. And so we propose a national primary day in off-year elections. They've done some polling. It's not that people just don't vote. They don't actually know that the primary is happening unless it's part of a you know, presidential year. Um, do you all know why we have elections on Tuesdays? So a couple hundred years ago, um, we had to figure out when to have our elections. And you know, just about everybody had some religious experience on Sundays. And a lot of people live too far from the polls to get there by horseback by Monday. So we vote on Tuesdays. You know, it's a nice tradition unless you have two jobs. And so you know, certainly thinking about ways that we can address the integrity issues and also increase access is something that I think um, matters a lot. The one thing that we can and should do about uh, money in politics is disclosure. This is unquestionably constitutional. Um, Justice Scalia has spoken on this a great deal, indicating that anyone who doesn't 
stand behind their beliefs, you know, doesn't belong in the public square. The you know, so-called dark money is part of what is really, I think, bringing the most aggressive toxicity into the process. If you don't have to own your ads, it inclines you to not be as responsible than if you, in fact, have to take credit for whatever you put out there. And so I think there is some possibility. Um, Senator Tillis from North Carolina was at our office yesterday and expressed that he would you know, support a move towards disclosure. That might go along with raising some of the caps. Um, you know, one of our big concerns, my personal concerns about um, money in politics is not just how much money is out there, but how much time these poor folks have to spend raising it. All the time. On the way to weddings. A friend of mine, you know, basically does this for them. You know, in restrooms, they're making phone calls. I mean, it, there is such a time pressure that it basically just takes people out of the actual commerce of legislating. Um, but I think I want to kind of end the little process pitch on what I think is essentially most important, and I think Senator McConnell is moving uh, the ball in the right direction so far, and that is that members of Congress have to spend more time together. And this is not suggesting that we go back to the 1950s where everyone lived in D.C. and hung out at Little League together. I mean, that's, that's not going to happen. Um, but last uh, year, members spent less than 100 days here in Washington. And many of those days were you know, showing up at 5 o'clock and leaving at 10 a.m. I mean, an incredibly thin amount of time. Our committee process has been dramatically weakened by leadership seizing control. There was an effort to um, take care of the seniority system, you know, the old bulls who were controlling these committees by making it more democratic. And of course, what actually happened was leadership just took all power. And committees used to be the engines of the democracy, right? I mean, people certainly had partisan differences. But they also had a shared interest. The Ag Committee cares about agriculture. The Energy Committee cares about energy. And that you know, added a little more um, collaboration. The leadership logically cares about being in leadership. So their enthusiasms are to do whatever they can to get their members elected and others defeated, less concerned about the actual outcome. Members of Congress should travel more. Right? OK, the Abramoff scandal was disgusting. But he was a criminal. And you rarely fix criminality with rules. The ways that people used to get to know each other was the 15-hour trip to Kazakhstan. Um, Lindsey Graham tells a great story about how he was heading to Afghanistan um, on a flight sitting next to Vice President Biden. And this was when they were really at odds over the troop surge. And just to break the ice, he said, you know, so Mr. Vice President, you know, how'd you get into politics? And as they landed in Kandahar 17 hours later, uh, the vice president says, well, Lindsay, I'm going to have to leave it there. But I'll tell you the rest on the flight home. <laughs> <laughs> Apocryphal as it is, you know, this is what I think was the connectivity that used to allow people to really have you know, harsh debates and then continue to work together. Um, something else which I advocate in my uh, book strongly um, is to bring back earmarks. They got out of control. Absolutely no question, 07, 08, out of control. Congress passed some very thoughtful constraints um, in 2009, 2010. They had to be publicly noticed. The administration had an opportunity to comment on whether they were in the public interest. Um, but these are essential to getting, and there's not a single major piece of legislation that has been accomplished without some attention to local interests. And if you step back for a minute, this isn't just about kind of greasing the skids, which makes it sound nefarious. This is the basic way our government was designed. We elect people with two contradictory demands. Serve your local interest and serve your national interest. And very often, think of the debt ceiling, right? I mean, nobody goes home and says, hey, I want to tell you about the great thing I did. I raised the debt ceiling. Um, but if you don't raise the debt ceiling, your constituents will suffer, as will the rest of the country, gravely if we were to default on our sovereign debt. So we're constantly looking to our elected officials to make tough national votes. And we're depriving them of any opportunity to bring something back to their constituents that would be popular. And so everyone gets cautious and doesn't do either. They don't do things locally, and we don't do things nationally. Um, you know, the uh, one earmark story, um, you know, we have a Civil Rights Act, essentially, because of earmarks. 1964, uh, Johnson, desperate to get the bill moving forward, 
stuck in the House Rules Committee where uh, Justice uh, Smith, you know, they call it Smith's graveyard. Um, Johnson had to get Republican to move the bill out of House. Uh, he went to the Republican minority leader, Charlie Halleck, and said, Charlie, what do you need? He didn't say it exactly that way. It was Lyndon Johnson. You can interpret the action. <laughs> Mood. And after a little while, Halleck said, I need that NASA Research Center at Purdue University. OK. So we got a NASA Research Center at Purdue University, and the country regained a measure of dignity. You know, take the deal. If we need a couple of roads and firehouses and airports, in order to pass the debt ceiling and reform entitlements and fix the tax code. You know, this is not a complicated conversation, but we've scared ourselves so much through um, what I kind of describe as the, the cult of transparency. And this has gotten me a little bit of uh, constructive conflict with some, or one of the chapters in my book is called The Dark Side of Sunlight. And so the Sunlight Foundation didn't love that. Um, <laughs> for reasons that I guess you can appreciate. But let me just kind of you know, close on this, which is we have created this notion that the opposite of transparency is corruption. The opposite of transparency is privacy. These are both essential elements in our constitution, in our basic value system. And I'm not suggesting for a minute that we should you know, wipe out some of these um, basic ideas of access. But we've made it almost <coughs> impossible for members of Congress to have a serious conversation. The cameras are everywhere. Totally different mood on the floor in the Congress today than there was before C-SPAN covered everything. Committees have the authority to meet in private, but there's a sense that if they do, they're violating some notion of public trust. You know, I try to bring this home by just suggesting, you know, just think about your own life. You know, my, um, my wife and I occasionally um, discuss whose in-laws should be visited on something like Thanksgiving. It would be a very different conversation if the in-laws were in the room, right? It just, it just changes the, it just does. And, and there's a lot of places where we do this with good intention, which has just gone too far. You know, the, the sunlight laws that require both at the federal and state level that if there's kind of a quorum of decision makers, they have to be open meetings. It just doesn't work. So you know, one of the most successful redistricting processes of late was in the state of Washington, Slade Gordon, senior former senator from Washington, was a senior fellow with us. He was on the commission. Two Democrats, two Republicans. So it was a really, you know, they had to figure it out. But if three of them got together, it was a public meeting. So they had a couple of meetings that were totally useless, not because of partisanship, but actually the fear of saying things that would alienate your own party when you're shifting seats around. And what they finally chose to do, which is what almost always happens, is you split the discussion up to something less than a quorum. So Slade and his Republican partner took one half the state and the other two took the other half of the state and they went off and they figured it out and then they had one public meeting and they slapped it all together, right? Not in the service of competence or uh, efficiency. Um, and so basically just, you know, the suggestion that uh, I make is that there's, there's moments in the deliberative process where the imperative for deliberation has to be understood to trump the imperative for access. And I will end um, on one of my favorite stories, which just suggests that we're a tiny bit out of balance. There's something called the toothpick rule. Now, I'm not sure if there are any um, paid lobbyists associated with any of your three organizations. But if there are, and you want to invite a member of Congress to a forum where they might actually eat, the food has to be of a size that can fit on a toothpick. Based on the, again, kind of post-Abramoff sense that there were these, you know, giant gold watch, you know, cigar smoking lobbyists, you know, taking out members of Congress. Uh, so shortly after this went into effect, a few years ago, I went to a uh, reception. And I must admit, it was, a, I don't know, remember who it was or which hotel. I mean, you know, these things are quite common. But um, the cool thing to do when you're going to a reception is to get there a half an hour late. No one wants to be there right at the beginning. Um, I screwed up and got there half an hour early. So it started at 7.30 and I got there at 7, I guess. And so I was in this big ballroom, uh, and I looked over at the kind of the big hors d'oeuvre table, and there were a bunch of folks in nice suits with their sleeves rolled up, you know, hacking at the food as the caterer just looked on with just you know, like abject horror. And 
it was kind of like a Seinfeld scene, so I went to just ask what was going on. The uh, general counsel for the organization had decided that the, uh, the food was unethically large. <laughs> and so they were beating the crap out of it. And you know, my only point is that you know, a meal is not gateway graft. Right? I mean, this, if, if we have such distrust for our members of Congress, the notion that they're going to trust and work with each other, I think, um, should you know, diminish. And so the, the good news is we don't need a constitutional convention, a so, you know, new social theory, Mars invasion. You know, Washington can work better. Um, we're actually off to a pretty inspired start. So on the Keystone legislation, which I would suggest is one of the less important bills that Congress will consider in the next decade in either direction, um, there were 41 amendments voted on. That might not seem shocking, but that's three times as many that were voted on in all of 2014. Um, they actually talked to each other. It was even a little suspenseful at times. You know, there was just time on the, in the well. And what members, I think, will acknowledge is that while it's true that toxic polarization is leading to gridlock, it's also true that gridlock leads to toxic polarization. It's just frustrating to be up there. One senator described his job to me as being a glorified telemarketer who occasionally gets to vote for an assistant secretary of education. They're just mad. And that channels, you know, paths of least resistance to the partisan battle. And so McConnell has made a commitment to move back towards regular order. Um, so far, he's holding it up. The Democrats didn't filibuster. They actually voted for the bill. And so that, that is probably a more significant sign of possibility uh, in Washington just about anything else. So I will stop there. Um, happy to talk if you want about any of the substantive issues or just get out of here. I'll just let me say one more thing. You guys have an amazing schedule. I looked at the schedule today. It is adequate. I've never seen anything like it. Um, you know, I know you've been doing this for a while, but the, you know, I know there's three organizations together. You know, if every state brought the kind of pragmatic knowledge and intensity of interest uh, to their delegations, I think we'd be in a much better spot. So you should be very proud, because it's not an easy thing to do. passing giant comprehensive pieces of legislation. We thought, and Henry can tell you, that we were pretty close to moving the House on immigration reform before unfortunate circumstances. Um, but there are still things getting done, right? You know, we um, have a group focusing on health IT, and great idea, right? We poured billions of dollars into it, but none of the systems actually talk to each other. And so, you know, we put together a kind of detailed proposal, and there was legislation passed to kind of create a framework for how to implement health IT. Um, before Putin went a little crazy, uh, we were looking at a bill on free trade with Russia, and you had to reconcile the kind of human rights concerns with the business community. And we were able to put together a group, with, uh, Don Evans and others, to kind of come up with a series of recommendations that basically found their way into law. You know, a crazy issue in the midst of all of this Iran um, engagement we didn't have the money to pay for the U.S. inspectors for the Iranian nuclear facility. 24 million bucks. Didn't have the money. Um, it seems ridiculous, but uh, we were able to bring together a coalition, um, you know, including you know, APAC and others, and you know, get that added to uh, appropriations. So I mean, there's, there's you know, a bunch of you know, modest pieces of legislation. Um, and our hope is it's a virtuous cycle, and Congress starts to engage and realize that solving problems is actually kind of fun, which has not been part of their world lately. Um, all right, thank you, everybody. Thank you.